There's an increasing disconnect between traditional leadership and the evolving modern workforce. The resulting poison from ineffective leadership is burnout, and the anecdote can be your company culture. Stay with us. I'm Lisa Smith, and this is Focus on Business. Our guests today have two very different backgrounds. One started at the pinnacle of culture, Disney. The other is a scrappy, community-minded entrepreneur that really built an empire around coffee. So we have today Keith Huckabee and Bob Fish. Thank you for being here. We're talking about company culture today. And um, Bob, I am so thankful that you're here today. I've heard presentations from you. You're so transparent about that journey that you've been through with company culture, where you are today. I'm interested in where did you come from? Right. So, you know, real brief history. We started with one store in 1995. By 99, we were franchising. By 2008, we had 100 units, and MSNBC called us the fastest growing coffee shop in America. By 2014, we were approaching 200 units, and the wheels got a little wobbly, you know. And um, we had built a culture that lived on these words, be happy, have fun, make friends, love people, and drink great coffee. And it turned out to all be a farce. Uh, Mike, my business partner, and I, uh, we were certainly earning more money, but we had created a, a culture of fear and distrust inside our home office environment. You know, we had managers that were doing what we called the midnight move out, which was they left a note on their desk that said, I quit, you know, without notice, don't call me. Uh, we had people coming to work uh, not really sure that they had a job the next day. And although Mike and I were adding zeros to our paycheck, we were quite uninspired ourselves, right? So we knew something was broken, uh, but we didn't know how to fix it. But we met what we call a shaman in the woods, right? So my partner was on Manitou Island. He had a happenstance meeting uh, with somebody that uh, embraces the idea of conscious capitalism. And uh, conscious capitalism, uh, there's several points to it. I won't go into them all, but it's really a stakeholder format versus a shareholder format where the stakeholders might be employees, your customers, your community, your vendors, and the environment. Okay? And he did an audit on all those, and we were sort of passable in most, um, but in our home office environment, we were definitely flunked out. And you know, we got this report, and if you would have read what we read, you would have cried knowing that that was your company. And the advice was that we stand in front of the company and read that letter to them. And it's on that day that things began to change. What an amazing story. Um, I have to say, I presume that the business owners that are watching the show right now, many of them have this story. Oh, for sure. And, yeah. and or there are many that have it and don't know it. For sure. And most certainly there are lots of customers out there. I am a frequent, our whole family mm -hmm. is a Bigby Coffee family yep. and it felt happy and fun yep. and drink great coffee yep. that's what it felt like when we walked into your store yep. so you don't know what that what that office culture is but it's certainly uh, something that you have to be purposeful about conversely so you started as a scrappy yep. entrepreneur I started in a little different way but you Keith you started at Disney yeah tell I us did. about your start yeah I well I was a directionless kid at age 19 living in Arkansas and uh, graduated high school from there and uh, had gone to tw uh, 16 different schools from kindergarten through 12th grade. So moved around a ton. So I look back at that and say I love that experience now. Wouldn't want to do it again, uh, but learned quite a bit. But what it did was it drove me to California. And once I got to California, I said, hey, um, I'm living with my brother. And I said, is Disneyland around here? And he said, actually, yeah, it's just down the road, just a few miles. Oh, I'm going to go apply and see what's going to go, what, what, what might, might happen there, right? Um, and so I went in there and knew nothing about it at all. Um, didn't even have a passion for Disney when I was a kid. Um, and so 
uh, went in there, uh, applied, had an interview, and it was the most amazing interview I have ever experienced in my life. Uh, we were on a panel interview with other candidates, and there were three people interviewing us. And what I thought was so impressive about it was that they were looking at us and seeing what kind of behaviors did we exhibit that helped the other candidates out. Not just how could I get the job, it was were you helping somebody else out when they were kind of fumbling and stumbling? Um, did you stop and say, hey, yeah, you know what, that's a great idea or stuff like that. So um, very inspiring interview. Um, and then through Disney, they had a great uh, program for, because uh, I didn't go to college. Um, they had a great program that made it feel like I went to college. You know, so when I came out of it, I eventually went to college and got my degree in business, but it was so easy to get. And it was so just like, oh, this is a no-brainer now. Um, but they, they understood that we had to provide value for our cast members, as they call them, um, through education. Um, because if we get them to understand what the experience should be like, then they're going to have a natural outflow to the customer. So it's fantastic. I totally yeah. recommend it. Yeah, Dis I mean, that's the gold standard of culture, right? They actually teach, you can go to Disney school, can you, can. you not? Yeah, yeah, they have the Disney University. Um, they, I think it's out of California and uh, Florida now, and so you can actually go do different conferences and things like that. Um, I, in fact, took some of my leaders to the Disney uh, Customer Experience uh, Summit this past summer, and it was just eye-opening for them. And it was exciting for me to get to see them experience what I got to experience, but in a, a much smaller way. But now they can actually... Um, bring that back to our small business and start implementing those things in our small business. Well, I was wanting, I was really excited to have you both here because you've both been through creating and transforming culture mm -hmm. and you come from such different backgrounds and different areas. I just want to really quickly touch though on uh, the conflict that happens between employees and companies when culture isn't quite right, um, lack of appreciation, this is how your employees are feeling, ambiguity, stress, uh, and then the big one, of course, is burnout. Um, the role that the individual has in the customer, uh, in, inside the company, is one individual at a time, and, but the culture is the blanket that insulates the positive or the negative. Um, companies that do pay attention to culture, reduce burnout, they feel connected. Mm -hmm. uh, these cultures instill a sense of purpose, success, well-being. They feel opportunities to grow, to develop. They get recognition. They feel appreciated. And so let's talk a little bit about what it is that has to happen in order for employees to start to respond in a positive way to a culture. How did you do that? Well, it's not easy once you sort of built a, a bad culture to turn, turn that around. Uh, you know, I think standing up in front of everybody and, and, and recognizing the problem was already a great first step. But, um, you know, the, the, the culture, uh, you know, the, the bad culture is dysfunctional when you take it over. So, you know, the next day you decide to have a good culture not everybody believes you right away or not everybody trusts you, right? But our basic approach is to look um, at the whole person and not just uh, the person as an employee, right? So uh, we have uh, a lot of tools throughout our day that we use to stay in touch with people. So at a meeting, for example, we'll run through something called MEPS and that's your, your mental uh, emotional, physical, and spiritual state, and it's just sort of a one-word comment on where you are right now, so we can just kind of check in with you. Uh, something else we do uh, is called highs and lows, so we might open a meeting and we might go through both professional highs and lows and personal highs and lows. Again, it just sort of addresses the person that's coming to the table today, right now, and so on. But you know the basic formula is uh, inside any company is it you know it has to have authenticity. It, you do have to be able to build trust. Um, you have to show vulnerability. Um, you have to be caring, and uh, kind of the beautiful thing is that all leads to, uh, leads to innovation. But um, I think the one other sort of singular component is people need to know kind of why they're there, and I don't mean what their job is, but when we talk about a purpose-driven company, what we're talking about is a higher purpose, and that is a purpose beyond money. So, for example, 
our purpose is that we support you in building a life that you love. And so that is, that is the mantra that we're operating under as we operate in any given day. I had the pleasure of seeing your employees speak <laughs> about this, and, and that's why I was so excited. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful story, and I congratulate you for that. What about you? Have you how has culture uh, transformed with your leadership, Keith? Um, it's been a interesting ride, let me put it that way. Um, so I came into our family business about two years ago. And so at that point, we're kind of new. Uh, most people can't have the uh, prediction of the future, but we did. We kind of knew what was going to be happening in the next two years. And uh, we knew that we had to fundamentally change what we were doing as a business. And so how do we even define ourselves, you know, the purpose-driven piece of our business? Um, and so part of it was, okay, well, what are we focused on was a big piece of this. And... Uh, Again, to borrow from Disney, I was like, hey, yeah, we need to pick three things that we're really just focused on here and kind of work with the results in mind. And the results that we kind of landed on were um, our valued associates, uh, customer satisfaction, and by the way, customer in our language is internal and external. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so that includes our employees as well. So I serve my employees at uh, TGG Solutions, right? And so I'm looking how I can remove pain points and take things out of their way to clear the path so they can do the job to the best of their abilities. Um, and then the final thing that we focus on is our capital effectiveness. And what we try to teach there is that, you know what, there are times when we have to spend money. So capital effectiveness is not just about how can we cut to prosperity, right? We gotta be putting money in the right places. And if we're putting money not in the right places, then let's, let's change that. But then what that does is it gives them those three things that we're trying to achieve. Um, and yes, there's a financial component to it, but we actually look at that as the consequence of focusing on those things. And so then what we do is we say, okay, what efforts do we want to put into this year to achieve these three results, okay? And so we focus on our culture, obviously, so the behaviors that we've defined and said, this is what we want to do in our organization. And, but conversely, we also say, hey, what are the things we don't want to do in our organization? And we actually list those things out and define them. So there's a really practical way for our employees to understand, oh, I can go around and hold each other accountable now. It's not just leader to direct report, it's anybody. Hey, this is a behavior we don't want to see in our organization. Let's talk about that, right? How can we get calibrated back to our goals here, right? So anyway, that's what we're on right now. Um, we're definitely in the baby stages of that. And we've got people kind of shifting positions based on we want to put the right people in the right places and focus on their strengths. Um, but it's a very exciting time. You guys both have used um some things, you know, uh, I own a business, which is why I'm the host of the show, because I'm, <laughs> I'm the audience, right? Um, we, you talk about saying, this is what we don't want to do. That's a really unusual idea. I, and then I'm thinking about what is the process we're going through as we're, um, in the last couple of years, we've adopted EOS, oh, the yeah. Entrepreneurial mm -hmm. Operating System yep. and Traction. And love one that. of, uh, love yep. it, just mm -hmm. love it. We've done a show on it. Uh, one of the things that we are now focusing on every quarter is reducing friction. So mm -hmm. that's kind of what you're talking mm -hmm. about there. What don't we want to do? So we try to identify friction for our customers, mm -hmm. friction for our processes, and friction for our people mm -hmm. internally. And we identify those things and we talk about them and then we do, we identify, discuss, and solve. How do we get rid of that friction? And uh, I think that that's been a really interesting, it's really our version mm -hmm. of this is what we don't want to do, yeah, right? But absolutely. in a kind of more of a problem solving way. I love how you're thinking about that. And then Bob, you brought up something that I think is probably the most important thing when it comes to culture, and that word for me is trust. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm reading a book right now called The Speed of Trust. Oh, right. Great book. Great book. Stephen Covey, mm -hmm. I believe. And I think the word trust has, it's, it's central to culture. Mm -hmm. If you don't have trust, you don't have culture. And that goes both ways. Yep. Employee, employer and trust in this evolving modern generation of workers is non-negotiable, right. absolutely not. If you've got a great employee under 35, trust is gonna be something that they are keenly watching within the organization. Uh, one of the things that I came across as I was researching for the show is that this younger generation, uh, they do expect diversity, they expect an inclusive culture and uh, something that I've never seen before that's important, very high on their list of 
cultural attributes is psychologically safe. For sure. So I came up, you know, in management teams where there was red-faced yelling, nose to nose, where people were bullied into uh, getting in line. Yeah. Uh, the f more fear you had about losing your job, the more effective and more uh, that, that your manager was considered and probably was going to get a promotion if everybody was afraid of them. Okay. And so psychologically safe is a co it's completely non-traditional way to think about things. When you look at your leadership team, what are the things that you're requesting of them to really focus on? Well, one of the things that we're doing um, is we're kind of focusing on the information hoarding. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that or not, but basically it's just this idea of, you know what, I'm going to keep this close to the vest because I'm the one who needs to have this information so that I can maintain my job, right? So there's, there's that other aspect of it as well. And so what I'm trying to do with our leaders um, is make sure that that doesn't happen, okay? Um, and through that, be vulnerable. Right? We talked about that a little bit. Um, it's super important, especially when it comes to trust and being psychologically safe. Right? Um, if you're not, you don't feel like you're in an environment where you can trust your leader, then you're probably not going to be as productive. Right? Um, but anyway, so the idea is that share what you know. Right? Train people on what you, you, you've learned. Uh, don't go to a conference and come back and just keep it to yourself. No, be ready to share that information with everybody else and hopefully everybody's keen to want to hear that information. Um, and so with that, um, it then means we have to make sure that we've got a solid uh, way to actually have feedback being shared, um, the mechanisms for that, um, making sure that if people do feel like, oh, I can't trust my leader, that there's a, there's a way for them to give feedback even in that environment as well. Um, so from an anonymous perspective, and hopefully then we can take care of those things. Um, but you know, ultimately, our goal is to try to get to a point where um, putting feedback into our feedback system is our last resort. We want people to talk to people. We want to build that trust, okay? So one of the things that we have to do is I'm trying to minimize the amount of work that my leaders have to do that keeps them in their office, that keeps them at their desk, and actually say, hey, how can we centralize that and give that to somebody else to do? But I want my leaders out walking around and doing management by walking around. And so that's kind of led to us starting to develop our own sort of system for that. Um, we're developing a web application for that that allows people to actually walk around, give real-time feedback, have an uh, informal conversation, but actually gather formal data. And then we can actually share that data with them at the end of the month or at the end of the year during a review, and it's fantastic. So um, one other thing I wanted to mention on the whole uh, uh, thing that the generation now is looking for is experience, okay? And I, I don't want to underplay that. Um, I went to the Disney Summit and they were talking about this idea that it's less and less about the product these days. It's actually about the experience around the product. And I think that actually can apply to our cultures inside of our organizations too. So, I mean, the way uh, that I like to articulate it is, um, you know, we have to demonstrate care, right? So when you're demonstrating care, you're not doing red face, you're not using sarcasm, you're not being demeaning. Uh, you're not using those tools to communicate. And in many ways, you know, what, what, what I think is we're, we're seeing the emergence of um, in, in it more, more feminine attributes to leadership than, than male attributes to leadership. So the whole red face was very male-driven, very aggressive kind of behavior. And uh, a caring culture is more... Uh, female-driven, right? I mean, not absolutely, but you get the idea. I think there's just a larger influence today from the female population entering the workforce. So there's that. The other thing is this idea of trust, and you have to connect the word vulnerability and trust together. You know, Lencioni, five dysfunctions of a team. What we're looking to do is to have healthy conflict, right? So if we have healthy conflict, we can build consensus and we can get our goals done, right? But but to get the healthy conflict, you have to have vulnerability-based trust. So it's not like, I don't trust you. It's not like that. It's that I trust that I can expose myself to you, you know, emotionally, um, intellectually, and so on, and not have retribution on that, right? And that I can ask questions and not have fear in doing that. Amazing words, yeah. So um, psychologically safe. When employees feel safe at work, 347% increase in profitability. 
277% increase in profitability of a highly rated employee experience. In, I'm sorry, in the probability of a highly rated. 154% increase in the incidence of great work. 33% decrease in the incidence of moderate to severe burnout. Mm -hmm. So that safe trust place is uh, very important. I just want to say thank you so much for sharing your story. Mm -hmm. I think there's lots of owners out there that are going to be very compelled by what they're hearing here, seeing it in action. Mm -hmm. And if anybody gets, so I understand that you're actually happy to share this with other people? Oh yeah, I'm, I'm out there talking about it, that's for sure. Yeah, can you, you know. go somewhere to get more information? Uh, well, we just uh, finished a TED Talk on this, uh, and just finishing it, they have to produce it and get it out there, but pretty soon you'll just be able to go to TEDx Detroit uh, and, and get that video and it'll lay it all right out there. Excellent, yeah. thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you. We have an interesting subject today on the show, and I, and just getting to know you and your company a little bit, I think you really approach it in an interesting way. Can you share that? Yeah, absolutely. Community outreach is really important to Providence, and we had a unique opportunity where we were asking our clients and customers, how are we doing as a business? And we were struggling to get that response, and we were looking for a unique way to take that and transfer it to our local community. So what we did is we came up with a program, we call it Feedback with Feedback. Help us with by providing feedback, and in turn, we'll feedback those in need here in Lansing. And we've had a tremendous response in terms of our clients are around 40% with returning. Um, the impact that we see with our local charities, which we switch up, is huge. We're able to see the difference that we make. And in turn, the transparency in our business and how we're doing has been tremendous. So when someone responds to your survey, you then say, there's a notch we're going to give back to the community because yes. of it? Oh, that's Absolutely. amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And now how do you choose the organizations that you decide to give back to? So they're ones that are near and dear to our staff's heart, which is great because our staff members get to see the positive feedback and how they're doing, and they get to see it go to a charity that means a lot to them in their personal lives. So it's a great community and staff outreach program we have. Do you change it up often? Do you keep it the same? We change it up every month. So each month we rotate on who we're contributing to here in the Lansing community. <laughs> That's amazing. So tell me, I just need to know, is there a hundred of them? Is there five? How many do you? We rotate between three. So we give to those in need, veterans and um, animals. Oh, animals, great. Well, we are so thankful that you're here and doing this great work in Michigan. Thank you. Thanks. Focus on Tech, brought to you by Providence, making technology easier. Hello, Leah. Hi, how are you today? Good, good. I am very interested here from an HR professional in banking, what makes a positive workplace culture? Well, at Dart Bank, we want our workplace to be fun. We don't want to have people drag in on Monday and dance out on Friday. We want to try to break that stigma. But we also want an engaged workforce. An engaged workforce drives profits. It's a quick and easy way, not always quick, but it's an easier way to drive those profits that don't, doesn't cost quite as much money as investing in new software and things like that. But it's so important to create a sense of ownership. When employees feel valued and have that sense of ownership, they're always more engaged. Conversely, what happens when there's a negative workplace culture? Unfortunately, when there's a negative workplace culture, that's when you see people leaving. And we know in this hiring environment, turnover is the last thing that we want to see. It's hard to replace people. It's expensive to replace people. So we really want to avoid that. Can you talk a little bit about your bank's culture? Yeah, absolutely. We are a very family-oriented culture. I'm really proud to say that we truly care about our employees and our customers. And what are some of the ways that you show how you care about your employees? 
it starts from the top down. Again, creating that sense of ownership, creating value, letting people know that they're valued. There's so many different ways that we do that through um, employee awards, fun days throughout the bank. We do a large employee appreciation day. Again, just spending one day just really carrying our employees and letting them know how important they are to us. Well, thanks for all the great ideas. I appreciate you being here. Absolutely, thank you for having me. Focus on Banking, brought to you by Michigan Bankers Association. Many businesses see conscious capitalism as their responsibility. Mm -hmm. What should they be watching out for? Well, um, obviously, it's a fantastic idea to want to be part of the community and give back, and you want to infuse that through your entire company. So it's natural to want all of your employees to take part, right? But what you can't do is you can't force an employee uh, on their own time to do charitable work and then not pay them for it. So it's got to be either completely voluntary or, look, we're going to do this charitable work, but you are going to get paid for it. You know, you can't just force employees to take a Saturday or take an evening um, and do it. You can do it during working hours when they're already paid, okay? And if, but if it's a weekend or if it's some other time that they normally wouldn't work and you're asking them to do something extra, then they do need to be paid for it, as great as it is and as as charitable as it might be and as well-intentioned as you are. It is still work for that employee because it's benefiting your company in some way in the PR aspect and they do need to be paid for it. So it's gonna be voluntary. Make sure that you're very clear, not wink, wink, nudge, nudge, it's voluntary, you better show up, but it's voluntary. They're not going to be uh, adversely affected in their employment if they don't. Uh, and if you're going to force them to do it, then definitely you have to pay them. What about uh, activities that have to do with uh, things like alcohol. Right, so a lot of charitable work or, or conscious capitalism, capitalism is going to be a, a, a charitable giving. Uh, it, sometimes we default to raffles, bingo, gambling, uh, events involving alcohol. And just because it's charitable doesn't mean that it's not regulated or you might be tripping over a law. There are very specific laws about when you can raffle off alcoholic beverages, for example. So as wonderful as it might be, and as well-intentioned as you are, what you don't want to do is trip over our law when you're trying to do it. So just take a moment and make sure that whatever it is you're doing, uh, you have a license to do, you have the availability of, of a license or a place that has a license to do it. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Focus on Law, brought to you by Policella and Associates, PLLC. We're looking for your stories, stories from owners of established businesses that have come through amazing adversity, or bucked the odds, or found the next big thing. If you have a story, we want to hear from you. Go to our website, and maybe we'll invite you onto the show. <laughs>